This is part two in the three-part series covering netcode capabilities. If you haven't already, I recommend starting with the first video and work your way through the series. This video will cover the networking tools for tracking state, communicating actions, and synchronizing location and physical interactions between client and server. Let's take a look at network variable. The network variable is used to synchronize a property between a server and clients without having to send a message or make a RPC function call. Here's some examples of what they look like. Since they are wrapper classes, you must specify the type during initialization and also use the value property to access the variable's value. There are some limitations to what can be synced with a network variable, but most types you would need are supported out of the box. Like bool, string through their fixed string types, and even vector3. It supports complex types as well, like network list, for when you need to check against multiple items to support your gameplay. You can also implement custom types as long as they conform to the required implementation, like the interface network serializable. There's even support to create a custom network variable implementation if needed. Network variables have support for permission changes that allow you to tailor which clients can read or write to them. For example, maybe you don't want everyone to know where your player's ammo count is. Through a similar permission statement, you can limit read access to only the owner client while still allowing the server to process updates. Network variables support on-change callbacks for when you want to perform an action based off a variable change. Let's run through an example. In my player controller, I have a network variable is player hit, which is set when a ball collides with a player. I listen for changes on this variable by setting the on value change callback here in the start function. And if we take a look, it just applies the hit color based on what the variable was changed to. To quickly see how it's updated, when my server gameplay manager is notified that a player was hit, it finds the player client and changes the value to true. After about a second, it changes the color back to the default material. This little bit of code will highlight the player that was hit on both clients. If you're wondering how that works, well, let's take a look. The server and both clients have their own respective representation of each of the network aware objects, like the player and ball prefabs. When a player throws a ball, the action informs the server through an RPC, which we'll review in a minute, and is simulated and synced to the clients where the events are rendered. The server then detects a hit and updates the respective is player hit variable to true. In this case, it's player one. Since every instance of player one has a running player controller script where the on value changed callback is hit, a targeted server side variable change is all we need to apply the color update to all player one instances. As you can see, network variables are an easy way to synchronize state changes and leverage those events to perform additional actions. This was just one example of synchronization for demonstration purposes, but there are other approaches like remote procedure calls for sending updates between the server and clients. Let's have a look. During multiplayer gameplay, some actions or game events need to be communicated between the clients and server. This is where a remote procedure call can be helpful. Here's a couple examples from my project. These are two server RPCs, and you can see there's nothing really special about them. They look like typical functions with parameters. Think of an RPC like a notification, where you can pass additional details to process an event or action. Like a base upgrade is complete, there's a treasure nearby, a card has been played, or a door has been opened. Whereas network variables are more for keeping state and synchronizing information between clients. Think ammo counts, health, cards drawn, you get the idea. The two types with Unity's netcode are client RPC and server RPC. Each require a specific naming convention and an annotation to indicate the type. Client RPCs must be annotated with client RPC, and the function name must end with client RPC. Server RPCs must be annotated with server RPC, and the function must end with server RPC. The Unity compiler will throw an error if these are not correct. Client RPCs can only be called from a server context, but will be executed on a client. There is no execution on the server. It all happens on the client version of the network object. By default, the RPC will be queued to execute on all clients, like maybe all players received a new buff. They can also be sent to a specific list of clients, for example, one of the players received a debuff. In the companion project, I used a client RPC to inform the players who won and lost the game. I chose to send different messages to each player, 
so I had to use the client RPC send parameters to specify the client that would receive the respective game outcome message. Server RPCs can only be called from clients but are executed on the server. Looking at the example player controller script, when a player wants to throw a ball, it will call to this throw ball server RPC function to request the server to complete that action. By default, only the client owner, that's to say, the client that owns the network object associated with the network behavior containing the server RPC, has invocation rights. Any client that isn't the owner will not be able to call to the server RPC. So in reference to the previous example, when the throw ball server RPC is called, the server knows which client made the invocation and executes the function within the context of the calling client. You don't have to sort this out yourself. But what about a use case where you want other clients to call to the same RPC? In the case where you have a shared or global server RPC, where you want multiple clients to have permission to use it, there's basically two approaches. The first one is to allow all clients to execute the RPC by setting the required ownership annotation parameter to false. The second approach would be to limit RPC execution to the owner of the script or object the RPC is contained within. For example, let's say there's a shield buff that anyone on either team could trigger to prevent getting hit. In reference to the first approach, you could set the require ownership to false on that server RPC, which would allow any player the ability to trigger the buff. This ownership style is ideal for shared actions that you want all clients to have access to. But instead of a buff that can be used by anyone, what if we had a special hat that only allowed the player wearing it to activate a shield? In this case, instead of there being a global server RPC, you could change ownership of the hat to the player who picked it up. With this approach, the hat owner client calls to the hat's server RPC to activate the shield and the server knows who to apply it to because it's tracked by the owner client ID property through the network behavior. No other clients can call to this except for the client owner of the hat. By default, netcode is server authoritative and owns objects that it spawns. If this doesn't work for some game feature you're building, you can adjust the ownership or expand the execution rights with the techniques we just discussed. Ultimately, you'll have to familiarize yourself with these strategies and decide which approach works best for your game. And to quickly piggyback on this ownership section, if a client needs to perform an action on an object that's server authoritative, you can always leverage an RPC to complete the action for you. This is exactly what I was doing with the throw ball server RPC. My clients don't have ownership over the ball, so they call to an RPC to execute the throw on the server. To synchronize a game object's position, rotation, and scale in real time during gameplay, attach a network transform component to it. The ball that each player throws is spawned on the server and has a force applied to it. You can see it fly across the screen on both clients. This synchronization is not performed manually in some update function, but simply through a network transform. Out of the box, you get an easy way to sync the location of objects across the server and clients. Unity has a built-in interpolation algorithm that it uses to smooth out transforms as they're received by the clients. This is enabled on the network transform by default, so if you don't want it, make sure to uncheck that option. The default algorithm is nice for slower paced games, but if you find it lacking, you may have to implement your own to handle the speed of your game. A network transform always synchronizes location from the server out to the clients and not from the clients to server. This would be server authoritative synchronization. In the case where you want your player to control the location, like in my demo game where each player controls the movement of their character, you have to implement a client authoritative network transform. To do this, create a client network transform script, extend from network transform, and return false on the overridden honest server authoritative function. Then on the game object you want to apply this to, Drag over the transform script you just created and do not add a network transform component as this will replace it. Also, add this before you add a network rigid body as it will try to add a regular network transform automatically. Then your client will control the movement of the player object and its location will automatically be synced across clients just like in the demo. And since your client is now controlling the movement of their player, it would be smart to add some server-side checks to make sure they aren't cheating. If you decide to work with the client network transform, be sure to perform some experiments with various scenarios that capture your general gameplay just to be sure it will work. 
as there are some gotchas, especially with collision detection. So speaking of collisions, Network Rigid Body is a component you can add to your game object to enable server-side physics simulation. In terms of my game, the ball has a component and the server will simulate any physical interactions it may encounter. The way Unity describes how physics simulation work is they always run on the server or owner authoritative instance of the objects. And then the resulting positions will synchronize across all non-authoritative instances. So for example, your server will simulate the collision of objects and then propagate those resulting changes to the clients or non-authoritative instances. The objects on the clients don't actually collide, they are just animated or transformed to simulate the physical interaction. So use Network Rigid Body on your game objects if you want them to physically interact and be synced across clients.